Good evening. Before we get started, um, I, if you would like to turn on your closed captioning, you can click the CC button at the bottom right of your screen. I'll give you just a moment to do that. So welcome, my name is Liz Ellis and I'm an assistant professor of history and a citizen of the Peoria Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. I'm here tonight on behalf of NYU's Native Studies Forum. We're a university-wide group that exists to create indigenous studies and programming on campus and to support our wonderful indigenous student and faculty community at NYU. I'm excited to join the Office of Global Inclusion tonight to welcome our stellar and pathbreaking um, Anishinaabe speaker, Leanne Simpson, as part of NYU's Global Scholars and Innovators series. In particular, I'd like to thank Autumn Rain and all of the really terrific staff at the Office of Global Inclusion for making this event possible. So I'm going to introduce our moderator tonight, Dr. Lisa Coleman. But before I do that, I'd like to pause for just a moment and recognize the extraordinary moment and circumstances that we're gathering in. I could not be more excited to welcome Leanne Simpson this evening. We may in the midst of a global pandemic at a time of worsening wealth disparities, immense suffering and dire political crisis. We truly are in a dark moment, but as indigenous people, we've been through the apocalypse several times before. The land that NYU and New York City now occupy is Manhattan, the heartland of Lenape homelands. And this space remains a center of the Lenape world, even as centuries of epidemics, colonial violence, and dislocation have flung Lenape communities as far as Wisconsin, Canada, um, and Oklahoma, or to the margins of the societies in their own homelands, such as the communities that exist today in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. But this city is also the heart of a beautiful contemporary Native community, one that includes more than 100,000 Native Americans, as well as a growing number of indigenous migrants from across the Americas who have built vibrant communities and formed mutual aid groups, cultural associations, and other entities that have supported our vulnerable community members through this pandemic. It therefore seems only appropriate that as we fight to protect indigenous communities across the Americas that are bearing some of the worst of these pandemics and state sponsored state centered violence that we have with us an indigenous intellectual whose work and activism centers on caretaking resurgence and resistance in the wake of truly apocalyptic times. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Coleman who will serve as our moderator this evening. Dr. Lisa M. Coleman is New York University's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation, and in the role serves as the institution's Chief Diversity Officer. Dr. Coleman works to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging, and innovation initiatives across NYU globally. Prior to NYU, Dr. Coleman served as the Chief, first Chief Diversity Officer and Special Assistant to the President at Harvard University. Dr. Coleman's scholarly work was sparked by early professional and research experiences, including working with the Association of American Medical Colleges, Merrill Lynch, and as an independent computer and analytics consultant for various for-profit corporation organizations. Dr. Coleman has spent more than 20 years working with numerous colleges and universities for for-profit and not-for-profit organizations on leadership, global inclusion and diversity, innovation and technology initiatives. These include and are not limited to collaborations with global stakeholders and university partners in New Zealand, South Africa, China, Thailand, the UK and Germany. Prior to NYU and Harvard, she directed the Africana program at Tufts University and was later appointed to serve as the institution's first senior global inclusion and diversity executive working with C-suite executives and reporting to the president of the university. Currently, Dr. Coleman continues to advise and consult with C-suite leaders globally and sits on various national and international boards. Her current research focus is on the intersections of innovation, inclusion, science and technology, arts and humanities, data analytics and digitization for diverse cultures globally. Dr. Coleman is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, which I will not go into at length, 
um, for her work on diversity, inclusion, equity, and innovation. Um, she earned her doctorate in social and cultural analysis from our program right here at NYU, as well as three master's degrees from Ohio State University in uh, African and uh, African American studies, women and gender and sexuality studies, and also in communication studies. Um, her undergraduate foci were social sociology and anthropology and computer science. I will now turn this over to Dr. Coleman, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Liz, and for that lengthy introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being such a terrific partner on this and in so many other ways. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us here today. As Liz said, my name is Lisa Coleman and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion here at NYU. Uh, I've been in this role for about three years. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, if you haven't turned on your closed caption, please do so if you need so. And uh, please note that this program is being recorded and it will be posted to the NYU stream uh, as soon as we uh, can get it up there. And it will also be posted obviously on our website. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today, welcoming Leanne Simpson back to NYU as part of our uh, Office of Global Inclusion, Global Scholars and Innovation Series. As I just said, thank you to our partners, the NYU Native Studies Forum and a very special Thanks to Liz and of course to Dean uh, Sarinelia uh, for all of the uh, partnership and work that you all have helped put this together, including the discussion, uh, this discussion, including discussion with the students. As always, I have uh, to thank my team, some of whom are on uh, behind the scenes right now. I have the pleasure of leading an amazingly talented group of people in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic, Strategic Innovation or OGI for short. And I'm thrilled to work with them every day. And I just wanna say thank you to you all. You have been doing an incredible amount of work during, as Liz mentioned, during uh, what are certainly challenging times. So thank you. Let me also say that, uh, as I say, I hope everyone is taking very good care out there. Um, people keep saying that uh, we're in some kind of normal. And I've been saying this isn't normal at all. We're in the middle of a pandemic and there are lots of challenges. And obviously, uh, as Liz mentioned, some particular challenges for certain communities. So I hope that everyone is taking good care of their family, loved ones, the chosen family, and, um, and remembering, obviously, um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, remember to take care of themselves as well. A lot has happened this year. Uh, we're in the midst of health and social crises and transformation. A quick glance at the news will show that for many parts of this country and uh, the cases uh, across the globe, the cases of COVID-19 are on the rise again uh, with continued disproportionate impacts among marginalized communities and particularly members of BIPOC communities, disability, the impact on women. Um, it has been a disproportionate impact on those historically marginalized groups. And in the US, statistics show that indigenous North Americans are suffering from COVID-19 um, at alarming rates. Uh, in some cases, 11 times more likely to be infected and 3.5 times to four more times likely to, um, to suffer uh, uh, great peril and death. And this statistic is flawed due to the longstanding systemic issues of inaccessibility to inadequate healthcare, uh, misrepresentation within or exclusion of um, native populations from public health data sets, as well as the recording of data and the way in which we talk about the way of, of knowing. And we'll come back to talk about some of it a little bit later. I want to uh, take a moment to thank Liz for acknowledging the land. And I'd like to take a moment before we begin to acknowledge all the people behind the scenes, all the front frontline workers, me, our healthcare workers, the nurses, et cetera. But I'd also like to acknowledge the behind the scenes workers, those people whose labor is often discounted or undercounted or not, or just not recognized. Um, for those people, for those, so many of us uh, during this pandemic, um, we've had to deliver had groceries delivered or we've had to go to the doctors so thinking about the people who clean the hospitals the facilities the people who deliver our groceries those people who actually have to expose themselves all the time so thank you for the sacrifice that so many are worth making for the well-being of so many others including myself 
I would also like to acknowledge everyone who, um, whose lives we've lost during this time. We've lost um, numerous lives because of COVID-19 and also because of the pernicious nature of state sanctioned violence, as well as, as I mentioned, of course, um, healthcare issues. So we hope that you will avail yourselves of resources, including the resources that are here at NYU. And it's important that each of us across, not just the NYU community, but beyond recognize the urgency and scope of impact that this pandemic has had and continue to prioritize uh, our well being. Thank you to our ancestors, to those, as I've said, whose lives have been lost and those who've paved the way for us to be here today, uh, who've given their lives, their ideas, and meaning. And again, thank you, Liz. I now have the inordinate great pleasure of introducing Leanne Simpson, who I'm, as I've said, excited to bring back, that we're able to bring back to NYU and have this conversation. And as Liz said, it couldn't be more timely. Leanne Simpson is a renowned indigenous scholar, writer, and artist who's been widely recognized as one of the most compelling indigenous voices of her generation. Her work opens the intersections between politics, story, song, lyricism, um, the, uh, narrative descriptions of nature and being. She brings audiences into rich and layered worlds of sound, light, and sovereign creativity. Working for two decades as an independent scholar using indigenous intellectual practices, Leanne has lectured and taught extensively at universities across Canada and the United States. And of course, was worked with people in New Zealand and other places globally. And across these 20 years experience with indigenous uh, organizations and land-based and on land-based education. She holds a PhD from the University of Manitoba and teaches at the Dekente Center for Research and Learning in the uh, uh, and Learning, excuse me. Leanne is the author of five previous books, including The Accident of Being Lost, which won the McEwen University Book of the Year Award, was a finalist for the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize and the Trillion Book Award which was and was long listed for the CBC Canada Reads and was named a best book of the year by the Globe and the Mail and the National Post and Quill Inquirer. Her uh, one of her latest books, As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017 and was awarded best subsequent book by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. Her most recent no novel, Newfing, New, excuse me, Newfing, uh, The Cure for White Ladies is forthcoming and actually, well, we have it out, we're gonna discuss it today from the House of an, uh, uh, Anasti Press in the fall of 2020. And Leanne is also a musician combining poetry, storytelling, songwriting, and performance in collect collaboration, excuse me, with musicians to create unique spoken song and soundscapes. Leanne's third record, The Theory of Ice, will be released in 2020. Leanne is a member of the Alderville First Nation and, as I've said, prolific writer, musician, and all-around scholar. Thank you for being with us here today, and thank you for agreeing to be in this discussion. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, miigwech, Lisa, for that fantastic um, interview. I'm so excited to be here visiting with you all today, virtually. Thank you. So let's just get started. Um, so uh, some people, of course, on this uh, who are participating are very familiar with your work, and some people are not. So I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about your journey your journey as a writer, and also a little bit about your journey as a musician. We'll be focusing mostly on your, your uh, journey as a writer today, but for those out there uh, who don't know and who have not had the opportunity to listen to some of your uh, musical work as well, I wanted to be sure that we uh, also talked about that because it's actually quite wonderful. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about your journey, uh, both journeys and the inter and how they're interwoven. 
Sure. Um, so I'm Michi Sagik Anishinaabek, uh, which is uh, the eastern doorway of the Ojibwe Nation. And our, our homeland is the North Shore of Lake Ontario in, uh, in Canada. Um, and I started, I guess, as an academic in the academy. I got my PhD, uh, all my degrees actually in the 1990s. Uh, I held a tenure track position for a few years at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. And then I left the academy, um, but continued to do scholarship and continued to write. And I think, um, I think the spine of my practice, the spine of my life, has been this tremendous love for Anishinaabe land and Anishinaabe people and our, our culture and our music and our language. And so I think that that's, uh, whether we're talking about my practice as a musician or a writer or, or an intellectual, that's the, the grounding and that's what holds, holds me together, holds the work together. That's the inspiration, that's sort of the thread through all of these, these pursuits. I didn't go to creative writing school. Um, my degrees are actually in science and then I have an interdisciplinary PhD. Um, and I would say my work, my academic work would be, be now in indigenous studies. Um, but I've spent the last 20 years uh, with uh, an elder, with several elders, um, learning about Anishinaabe storytelling and um, learning about how Anishinaabe aesthetics and how I think our people drive meaning, meaning out of life. Um, and so my work is really based in Anishinaabe thought um, and how Anishinaabe people structure the world. And I think um, being outside the academy and having this as sort of the base of my, my practice of life and my practice of art, has created a different body of work because I didn't have the same sorts of restraints that my indigenous colleagues have to um, navigate and negotiate and refuse in the academy. And so I was able to, um, in some ways, create this body of work that didn't, didn't have to conform to, to the structures or, or the, the norms of the academy, and I find I find creative writing and creating fiction to be a very very generative process because in my academic work, and I think that that's a really beautiful and powerful tool, um, and and it's a, a way of making certain interventions into the world. But in my creative work, um, I'm able to not just sort of critique and talk about things, but I'm actually able to to build build things, build worlds. And I think that's really what what Nopaming is is about is building um, building Anishinaabe worlds that are very much based on deep um, complex relationships with each other and and with the land um, in the present. Great. Thank you so much. So let's talk a little bit about how you came to write your most recent book. But one of the things that you just said, which I really actually do want to piggyback on, is this idea of building worlds. Because actually, I think as I, well, all, in all of your texts, right? And so it's that idea of building worlds and building in this relation, which of course you just talked about in relation to the land. And so could you just talk to us a little bit, I, I know that this question is a little off from the questions I said, but, but thinking about that, that in relation to your most recent text, but also sort of the trajectory, right, of your writing and so, and how you um, even thought about that is across the course of your sort of writing career. So oftentimes indigenous peoples are, are positioned in the past and historicized. Um, in a race from urban spaces and a race from the present. And oftentimes our, our cultures are assumed to be very, very local and our knowledge is assumed to be very local. And well, there's, there's parts of that that are true because we have such an intimate relationship often with space um, and place and land. Uh, because our, our cultures and our way of thinking is relational based on these very deep relationships, 
that are bound by things like consent and diversity and an ethic of non-interference. Um, and, and with this larger vision of living life in a way where you're bringing forth more life rather than ending life, um, you have sort of a different organization of the world and a different organization of society and a different organization of thought, a different orientation of thought. And so in this book, I, I wanted to keep that in, in the forefront. Um, when you have deeply relational um, organizations, they're also global in nature and they, they really um, encapsulate sort of the international connections that you have in local spaces and for Anishinaabe people, that might be humans, other humans we're sharing time and space with, it will be animals and plants we're sharing time and space with, it will be the waters, the air um, and, and the soil that we're sharing time and space with. So I found that was a really interesting and generative concept that I wanted to think about. And I wanted to spend a lot of time in, in this, in this place called Nopeming, I guess. And then I think um, another thing that I was thinking about is the way that my ancestors lived. Um, I was thinking about how a few hundred years ago, they would get up and they would make, they would make everything. They would make their food systems, their economic systems, their spiritual systems, their theories, their stories, their clothing, um, their diplomatic relationships, their politics. And origin stories are so important to indigenous peoples. Um, this idea of making, this idea of practice, this idea of, um, I guess, getting up and building the world that you want to live in rather than relying on things like institutions or, or sort of that kind of structure that comes with racialized capitalism. So I thought that's a really interesting way of, of living. And I see indigenous people and black people and brown peoples uh, doing this kind of world building work in our cities in the middle of a pandemic, in crisis, in times of, of relative calm. But I think this is one of the things that uh, strategically has got me here. This kind of practice of, of building indigenous worlds, of finding indigenous joy, of doing all of this work anyway, in spite of and despite um, what, what Canada or the US was doing. And I, I thought that's a really, really beautiful uh, thing that I've inherited and that I'm a part of. And so I wanted to spend some time really thinking about the kind of world that uh, I wanted to live in, but also affirming and recognizing around me the kinds of worlds that the people that I'm in deep relationships with are already building in the present that are maybe unseen by, by whiteness. So I wanted to sort of bring those into the focus so that I think, um, brown and black and indigenous readers would also sort of feel affirmed in their own resistance and own world building. Thank you very much. And I know I, uh, uh, in your, in your, I guess it's the epilogue, you, you talk about Robin D.G. Kelly and, um, uh, and his, this idea of joy. And, um, and I'm going to come back to ask you about a couple of things, including the beginning with, uh, Dion Brand and Fred Moten, but we haven't gotten there yet. So, uh, so let me, um, let me pick up on some of the things that you've been talking about right now, which, uh, and so my next question really is around um, this, 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 this idea of what whiteness sees and doesn't see, right? In this, uh, in the space of the colonial. And, um, and so one of the things that you have articulated, I think very clearly is Right, the dignity and autonomy of indigenous peoples, and I could add right to your to, to say black, et cetera, as you as you just said, do not simply exist because of their colonizers and occupiers. Right. And so you actively engage in this process of decolonization. And part of it, part of the way I think, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm I don't want to put words in your mouth, but part of the way I see it is through this, the aesthetics and the poetics. Um, and the ways in which you actually use language 
you take language, disintegrate it, reimagine it, put it back together. Um, and then you bring forth, as we just talked about, right, these, these, these different ways of knowing, these different textual ways of knowing, whether you're talking about space or time or nature. And so could you just share with our audience a little bit more about these concepts of what it means to try to decolonize with language through story and narrative as you talked about earlier. And then also because the characters that you create, right, are not the, maybe it's maybe it's great you didn't go to creative writing school because maybe they would have boxed you into this sort of right formulaic character, right, development. I have a lot of creative writing friends. so. Right, so tell us about that also, the way you develop not the language, but also the characters, because you are using those images, et cetera, as well, I think in that space of decolonization. So my question, I know it was long-winded, but it's language. And then of course, thinking about the ways in which you are creating and, you're, and to use your language, building new characters. Yeah, so I think, first of all, um, I'm a language learner in my own culture. So the, there's been a lot of language loss because of dispossession and colonialism in my, in my own territory, but we still have access to, to speakers. There are still a few speakers left. And so in my academic work and in my artistic work, I've used language as, as a window into, um, into Anishinaabe worlds, I guess. And our language is composed mostly of verbs, not nouns, because that practice and that process is so important. Um, we don't have uh, this, this colonial gender binary in our gender pronouns. So I wanted to think about, um, as someone who is not a fluent speaker and who writes in English, I wanted to think about how to take some of these larger concepts that are encoded in the structure of our language and bring them into the world and figure out a way of, of talking about them in English. And so the idea, I'm gonna give an example because I think that might illustrate it better. I wrote a lot of this book in the morning. So I would get up really, really early and I would sit at my desk and I would watch the sunrise and in my language, the word for, for dawn is bidabin. Bidabin is a name that a lot of kids in my, my community have. It's one of those words that a lot of Anishinaabe people know, even if, if we're, you're not fluent. Um, and, and if you translate that word literally, it's dawn. If you understand the word on a little bit deeper level, then you'll know that the word means it's that first bit of light that's coming up over the horizon before the sun rises. So it's that first bit of light. Then if you're able to break that word down into the, the three tiny words that make it up, the B part at the beginning is a prefix that means the future is coming at you. The da means home or the present and the ba is a suffix that we would add onto the end of someone's name after they had passed on. Um, so it, it denotes the past. So when you're watching the sun come up every morning, it's bedauben, it's that moment, it's the present where the past and the future are collapsing in on itself. So I thought, how do you, that's the world that, that my ancestors lived in. They knew that the, their ancestors were not from the past, but they were pouring their energy into the present and they were influencing the present. They knew that those ones that hadn't come yet, the future, that they were building this world for the future. So how do you take this idea of time um, and a deeper sort of philosophical and ethical uh, concept of Badabin and, and make, it a, make it a world? And so that's one of the sort of concepts that I was that I was thinking about, and that I've been thinking about and working with for a while now, in in Nokuming. and that's um, that my understanding came from from that language and and using Anishinaabe Moan as sort of a window through. Um, yeah, no, I can't remember what the second part of your question. No, that's okay. Was. It was too long. That's why. Right. <laughs> too long. It was too long of a question. So my second part of the question is the way in which you do character development. Right. Okay. Right. And you, I, and I'm saying that because for those of you out there, please buy all of her books and read all of the books. <laughs> um, 
but but because of the way you develop characters, which are not is not the same in all. I'm not I'm not trying to just all the book, but I'm saying like it's not always the same as you think about character development as as that creative writing class, right? So that's the right. That's what I'm asking you, yeah. So the narrator of the book's name is Mashkawaje, which means he, she, or they are frozen in the lake. And Mashkawaje has experienced some sort of trauma, which is so common in our communities. And it's also common to really foreground that trauma as part of truth telling because it is our truth. But one of the things I was thinking about is just how whiteness loves our trauma and loves to consume that trauma. And for me, that trauma is something that's that's very private and it is not up. It is not up for consumption. And so in this book, the trauma was sort of set aside and it was alluded to, but we never really know what that, that was. It has left Mashkawaje metaphorically, conceptually and physically frozen in the, in the lake. They are shut down, they can't feel anything. And so they rely on the seven main characters of the book um, to help them navigate life. And there are older characters in the book, Mindamoya, and uh, Akewenze, they represent sort of elders. There are younger characters like Lucy and Asin that, that represents sort of youth. And so there's this, um, this beautiful, I think, loving and very funny interaction between the, the elders and, and the younger members. There's um, a character, uh, Nenatik, that is an, an old maple tree um, and that was to really foreground this idea that we're, you know, when I talk about an Anishinaabe nation, I'm not talking about one that's based on enclosure. I'm talking about, I'm refusing that kind of idea. And I'm talking about the, the time and the space and the land that I share with that, that maple tree. Um, the spiritual world is alive. Um, and so the maple tree is, is able to do things that maybe you don't think maple trees normally do. Um, there's a character that's a caribou. Um, now caribou in Ontario existed 200 years ago, but they don't, they don't exist here anymore. So I took this idea of um, the spirit of a caribou still being part of this land and, and still uh, being an influencing part of this land. Um, and so those seven characters and their relationships almost form to me a place or almost the setting of the book. Um, and I, and I wanted to take this idea. I mean, I set out, I tried to write a longer form. I tried to write a novel, but we don't have novels in our oral storytelling. And thank goodness, because a lot of, you wouldn't want to just sit there when somebody recites their like novel for 48 hours. Um, <laughs> so when I tried to have, when I tried to think of a longer form, this is what, this is what came out. And I think this is also very representative of, of a kind or my experience with Anishinaabe storytelling in that there's song, there's poetics, there's, there's beautiful moments. There's a lot of silence as well. Um, there's time to reflect. There's, uh, and I think that idea of um, colonialism has been a very fragmented, fragmenting dispossessing experience um, for me. And so that I wanted to have that kind of feeling of you're always searching for belonging, you're searching for care, you're searching for connection, you're searching for attachment, you're trying to put like your language back together or your, your land back together or your community back together. So I wanted to have that kind of fragmented feeling in the, the structure of the book as well. But I really, to be honest, I fell in love with these characters. Some of them first appear in Islands of Decolonial Love and then some of them Sabe appears again in this accident okay. of being lost. And then I just, I mean, I feel like they're friends that I carry around in my head and, and uh, I have a lot of love, a love for them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, this is, and you brought this up in this last, uh, in this discussion, but even in your former uh, answer, because I want to talk to you a little bit about the use of non-binary pronouns, right? Again, breaking with these sort of uh, tropes and, and traditions and literature. So talk to us a little bit about that, because um, it's one of the things actually in the characters that I think is super interesting in how you weave them together with the, with those, um, with the they, right? With the use of they and, um, and the non-binary. 
Right. So all the main characters in the book are, are non-binary. And that was done because um, in my in Anishinaabe worlds, um, particularly pre-colonial worlds, we had more than, than two binaries. We had a diversity of, of um, gender orientations, sexual orientations, and relationship orientations. And so I wanted to reclaim some of that queer normalcy in the book. Um, I wanted to I wanted to give readers a different reading experience. And one of the things about these characters using they them is it really challenges your brain. It challenged my brain writing it and it challenged my brain in um, editing it. And I've heard a lot of readers say the same thing that it really highlights how ingrained um, hetero patriarchy and hetero the normalcy is sort of in our reading experience because you're oftentimes your brain is 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 trying to assert a particular gender into say the Mindamoya character who we might know in my culture as an old woman that would be the literal translation but the deeper cultural translation is the one who holds things together so there isn't a gender attached to that um, and that they them pronouns sort of give give nod to that. So I think in Canada, there ha we have this amazing, rad, young generation of emerging indigenous queer writers right now who are just uh, changing the landscape so quickly and beautifully uh, with their work. Um, folks like Lindsay Nixon and Billy Ray Belcourt. Um, and a lot of indigenous trans writers as well. And so this was sort of, I don't wanna take space away from them. This was just sort of this tiny, tiny, I, I didn't, I think when I began doing it, I didn't um, expect it to have the impact on the reading experience that it did. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's naive, but um, yeah, I feel like this is just a tiny thing, but I think it does uh, create this experience that's a little bit different when you're you're trying to read and I started doing this I started thinking about this in islands of decolonial love and at that time I really had to advocate for I have one story where the characters don't have genders and there was a lot of discussion at that time which was like five years ago six years ago seven years ago not very long ago where there there was this advocate I had to advocate because the editors were like, you can't like, that's grammatically incorrect. That's like, people are gonna be so confused and it's changed very quickly. And so this again was sort of taking this Anishinaabe idea and trying to figure out how to work it into English. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, let's um, pick up on a couple of things here. So I want to talk a little bit more. I want to go back to some of your comments around consumption and, and trauma. And so uh, in the U.S., uh, we have these months. We love months. We love months here. We love uh, we love to declare months for people. So uh, you know, we we have a month for gay people. Uh, queer people, we have a month for uh, indigenous people, we have a month for black people, a month for women. Um, and so I I'm obviously being facetious here. If you can't, if you don't know me, you can tell that I, this is obviously a thing that's a little ridiculous. So, so, and one of the things that you talk about, and you actually, I, I won't remember what page it is on, but I did write it down and you have this ceremony is not Instagram, which I loved. And so really just, thinking about this idea of consumption, who gets, how consumption happens, right? And the kinds of state sanctioned and national appropriations that can happen and the sort of, and this, uh, and what you have described as uh, extra extrication, right? Is it extra, mm -hmm. extra, it's, it's sort of the removing of? Right, right, extractivism, yeah. Extractivism, and so thinking a little bit more about how these commemorations and how these ideas are part of that practice practice of extractivism. And also, could you just talk to us a little bit more about the idea then of re-traumatization, right? That this this is there's trauma and then the re-traumatization that happens in this these practices of state sanctioned violence. Yeah, so there's this uh, performance. I think the state performance of for in Canada has been reconciliation. So 
um, the state does things like declares Black History Month or Indigenous Peoples Day on, on June 21st and gives the um, impression that things are different and that things have changed um, and they're celebrating. And of course, these are part of, of neoliberalism. These days are, are, are for white Canadians and white people to feel good about themselves. Um, and they're not particularly for indigenous people. And so I think one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about in my work is how we have to um, bring in critical thought and that our ancestors were very good at critical thought and then critical action and mobilizing and building something different. Because if you just believe that everything is okay because we have all of these days and we've made these superficial changes, we've, um, we've coded things in a particular way, but we've maintained the same structures that are gunning down black people in the streets or are, are shooting indigenous children in, in the laneways of, of farmers, then we haven't, we haven't changed. So there, there becomes this dissonance in experience of being indigenous and, and what the state is sort of signaling. And I think in Canada, because we've had the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and had that process going on, we've had a focus on residential schools. We've had a focus on individual trauma that took place at residential schools. And um, we haven't focused on the broader systems and the broader sort of harms that communities and indigenous people felt. And I think that that's really important um, when I look at how indigenous people have mobilized in the past is uh, sort of rejecting this idea of individual and bringing the community and, and working and mobilizing and figuring out how to meet the needs of community and, and to kind of reject that continual uh, focus on, on individuality and individual harm. Um, I think that I find it really uh, this um, consumption of trauma and then the re-traumatization of, of community is something that you'll see repeated over and over and over and over again. And so it's very, I find it very interesting when our communities disrupt that and refuse that and uh, figure out ways of um, disconnecting from that and bringing in this, this practice of radical hospitality and radical care, you know, anyway, that's, I think that's a really beautiful part of it. Thank you. I would like to say to our participants, please drop some questions in. Uh, they've been, uh, we've uh, sent some directions. So please drop some questions in if you have questions. I'm gonna ask one more question and hopefully we'll get some questions from the audience. I could ask you questions all day, but uh, <laughs> I will. Um, <laughs> so, um, so actually, and this sort of piggybacks on this last question. Um, in, in, in recent months, uh, you know, we have seen lots of challenges. Obviously, Liz mentioned that in her opening, it doesn't matter, you know, across the globe. And then we've seen, obviously, the um, differential impacts on communities, uh, particular uh, communities and cultures. And what we've also seen, which I think has been, um, which some people have been surprised, I guess, that there was racism in the world or something. So people have been surprised by the protests and uh, some of those things. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit and uh, especially to the global protests, right? And the things that have been happening. And I, I know, and for those of you out there, uh, you have been part of a movement called Idol, Idol No More. And so could you just talk to us a little bit about um, the role of, um, right, movements, right? And, the, and how movements uh, and these protests, because and 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 I'm I'll, I'll I'll end this question by what we've seen here in the U.S. and maybe you've seen this in Canada a little bit, is sometimes the protesters are blamed for causing the trouble, right? Uh, why don't you all go back and uh, etc. Uh, and so uh, so let's talk about the role of protest, the role of movements, right? In this in these spaces of decolonization and um, and. Uh, an address to capitalism? 
Yeah, I think one of the things that is very has been very parallel alongside my experience of the pandemic has been this tremendous organizing uh, and mobilizing of uh, the movement for Black life and Black Lives Matters. And that has been such a prominent part of the landscape in Canada and in Toronto and Ottawa and in the spaces in between all across Canada, actually through the pandemic, organizing through the pandemic um, to, to uh, highlight those statistics that show we are not all in this together, actually. There are certain communities uh, that are experiencing an asymmetric level of violence because of COVID-19, um, organizing around um, immigrants, organizing around immigrant workers, organizing around um, uh, the opioid crisis that in a lot of places like the, the downtown east side of Vancouver is, is um, claiming more lives than, than COVID and has been intensified because of the pandemic. Um, organizing to meet the needs of, of those frontline workers who are disproportionately black and brown and not just doing the protests, but actually uh, distributing resources um, and doing that anyway, doing that even though people don't have time and people are exhausted. Um, and so I think that for me has been a really, uh, a really amazing part of this. And I've seen the conversation in Canada uh, get pushed into a different register. So I never thought in my lifetime that I would hear people on our national radio station talking about abolition and defunding the police. Like if somebody had said that six months ago, I would have been like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not happening. We talk about reforming the police in body cams. We don't... <laughs> But um, the, the, you know, having these sports teams changing their racist names was something that uh, indigenous people have been organizing for two decades about and Black Lives Matter got it done. And so <laughs> I feel like I've become very interested in, in thinking through and talking through um, a, a sort of relational, a grounded solidarity and figuring out how, um, how to bring uh, these two movements that have different histories and that have different experiences, but are also linked um, together. So I'm thinking about how does my Anishinaabe world building, how can it support and feed energy into um, black world building? And I think that, that that's something that I, I'm very, very grateful for over the course of this this pandemic, because it's been uh, it's 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 helped my practice of hope. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. And and then right, I, I think many of us are seeing things we didn't think we would see. But it and I do. I want to just underscore right now. I think that how we how those connections right are made across communities and cultures and we haven't always been good at doing that that's right so this is an opportunity i think you're exactly yeah. right so i'm going to turn to a couple questions from the uh from our, our participants the first question which is one of the questions that i was going to ask anyway so this is great uh is can you speak a little bit more about radical hospitality uh radical uh care joy and how what this looks like in community the practice of it in some ways it's really simple things that i think a lot of our families have always done and it's um this idea of of home um inviting uh, inviting the friends and the family into the home feeding them sharing sharing has been such an important foundation in an or in anishinaabe culture um, as a practice, share what you have, take only what you need, use everything you take. Those are very simplistic ways, but the actual, I think, practice of care and the practice of sharing and the practice of a radical hospitality and a practice of, of caring very, very deeply about the living things that you're connected to, not just locally, but globally. Um, for me, that creates a, a different way of living that that really calls into question some of the foundations of colonial society, like heteropatriarchy and capitalism and, and white supremacy and hierarchy in a way that's, that's interesting 
to me. And it's, um, I think it's also something that our, that our ancestors and that our families have been, been doing and have had to do uh, for a very, very long time. If, if, you don't, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't rely on the state um, and our state's institutions and whiteness to do that for us. And so I think that we have some pretty amazing practices of care that are, uh, that I until, until more recently have just sort of taken, maybe taken for granted, or I haven't, um, I haven't spent the time thinking about them. And so, yeah, that's Great. a pretty amazing question. Thank you, thank you. And so the next question is, um, it seems like the front lines of climate change, or change, excuse me, I should have put on my glasses, are also front lines of native sovereignty struggles, oil pipelines, fracking, telescopes, and uh, sacred lands, et cetera. And these lines slash blockades are in intensely militarized on the part of the state. What, what would you suggest the role of art and creative practice might be in relation to these struggles? And how have you seen actions by uh, protectors that perhaps inspire you? I think art and creative practice can be a mechanism for supporting our, our relatives that are doing this hard work on the front lines. It can be a way of feeding energy into to the movement. It can be a way of caretaking those people that are, are making making sacrifices on the front lines. Um, so I think that it, it, I think that practice of joy and making art and making music and making uh, books for our people, not to educate white people, but for our people so that we can feel good and strong and seen and affirmed. I think that's a really important practice. I think that as a performer, um, when I go out on a stage in a bar or in a theater, I have a different audience in front of me than I do in the classroom at a university. I have a group of people that may never set foot in the university when maybe would never read any kind of my political work. And I have an opportunity to create an environment where to create an Anishinaabe environment, to call into question some things I want to call into question and to, to create an experience. I have a bit of power when I step up to that microphone. And so I like to think about the kinds of spaces, the kinds of decolonial spaces um, that you can build in time and space that are through a relationship with the audience um, that might be struggling or unsettling for the white people in the audience and might also be affirming. Uh, to the brown people and the indigenous people and the black people in the audience. And so I feel like the work then needs to be very layered. It needs to be coded and it needs to have this ability to speak across audiences, which I think indigenous stories and indigenous art making um, has, has, a, has a history of doing. But I think that's a really interesting and, and sort of beautiful way of, of connecting with people and of building something. So I see the work of art and creative pursuit being really important and really uh, linked into to mobilization and, uh, and resistance. And I think this will be our, our final question really. And it's, it's a question, it's really a question about you, I think. It's a question about the forms of expression. So a couple of people have asked it twice, it looks like. So can you describe forms of your expression. So I think what they mean by this question is such as your artwork and music. I think what the question is asking is, um, tell us a little bit more about how you think about, and you just talked a little bit about this, right, in terms of art and the creative practice, but tell us a little bit about the expression of art and music and how you see that working as you do this in community and bringing communities together. Because, right, I think, as you just said, right, it's a different audience when you're performing. So it's a different audience that you're curating and bringing together in these spaces. So talk to us a little bit about that curation, the expression with these audiences and building community in uh, through art and, and your artistic expressions. 
think that's one thing that's really clear to Indigenous academics is that our community and our knowledge is not at the university. And so I think we have to have a practice of, of uh, leaving and refusing the academy and going back into our communities to do our to do our studies because things are happening around kitchen tables things are happening in the bush things are happening in tents things are happening in the in the bar um and and in in uh in art making um, um places and so i think that we have to have this diversity of of practices going on in order to to have a, a generative space where these knowledges are, are coming together. Um, I think that in some ways, um, a lot of the foundations of Nopaming you will find in as we have always done. That's the academic version of a lot of what I talk about in Nopaming. Then Nopaming is sort of a, an artistic uh, version of that. And then um, because I think this layering is very important and this coding and, and having the work um, speak to different audiences and speak across audiences. Um, Nopaming is also, there is also a, uh, an EP that my sister and I made at the beginning of the pandemic because of course musicians <laughs> have not been able to play together now for several months. Um, and I, was, I wasn't sure uh, how this book was gonna travel in the world not being able to leave the house. And so um, if you, you can look up the Nopaming sessions on Bandcamp and it's a, it's a four track EP of readings from Nopaming over sort of ambient drony um, electronica sounds that were, was composed by my sister and performed by my sister, Ansley Simpson. She's a singer songwriter in, in Toronto. And then we took that first track solidification and we worked with Sammy Chian, who's a Taiwanese Canadian new media artist. And he created a, a uh, an amazing video um, kind of short film of, of that. And so again, that takes the work and adds another artistic layer. His, his uh, dad made a woodcut, a traditional Taiwanese woodcut. Um, we have uh, solidification translated into syllabics and then also into to Taiwanese characters. And so it takes, the, um, it takes the work and then adds another visual layer. And so it's interesting as you can read the, the beginning of the book to yourself from the novel. And then you can hear the, the, you can add the music in and listen to solidification with music. And of course, music adds an emotional element uh, that, that, that words alone don't have. And then you can see this sort of visual. And so I think that layering and seeing how the work travels in the world is something that, that's what I really, really love. And that's what I was really worried about at the beginning of the pandemic, because I was like, I don't know, I don't know how this, this book is gonna find its way. And then the middle part of the book is a series of poems and poetry called The Theory of Ice. And that's um, seven of those tracks are on the, um, the Theory of Ice. And so that's more of a, a sort of an indie rock, um, full band, we just made vinyl. So that's been exciting. I've been listening to the test pressing. Um, and so that again is another way of taking this novel and taking as we have always done sort of into to live music venues if, if and when that's ever allowed. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I'm working at this, I'm working with these same sets of concepts um, in as we have always done. It, it, but just into these different forms and these different practices. And I should say that Nopaming is being published in the US by the University of Manitoba or the University of Minnesota Press in, uh, in January. So it will be also more widely available to US audiences then. Thank you for letting us know. Mm -hmm. But if you'd like to buy it now, you can download it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so my next question is, uh, is really about the concept that you've talked uh, about which is this idea of land as pedagogy. And so uh, uh, both in this book, but in your other books, so talk to us a little bit about this concept of land as pedagogy. And I'm, I'm gonna ask you another question from the audience. I think I wanted to take this idea of um, land as a, as a teacher and as a, as a relationship and um, 
complicate it and deepen it. So what does it mean for, for one of the characters in the book to be this, this very, very old maple tree? I've worked with this maple tree before. It's um, in this kind of tiny fragment of um, old growth forest where I, where I live in Peterborough. It's one of the oldest trees in our, our territory. Um, there's a song from this accident of being lost called the oldest tree. Um, it's about 400 years old. So I was thinking about this tree as ancestor, this tree as witness. So what has this tree witnessed over the last 400 years? What can I learn from this tree? Um, we're breathing the same, I'm breathing out oxygen. Um, Nanatic is breathing in that oxygen and, and breathing out carbon dioxide. So I wanted to really take this idea of, of land, which is a noun, and I wanted to change that back into um, these beautiful and complex uh, relationships and talk about how you live in a way where you're promoting more life, where you're setting up a world that gives that's in, a, in stages and cycles of continual rebirth and not just the rebirth of humans, but of, of all these living things. So how do you live in a way that's generous in terms of life giving rather than um, what we're seeing as a, a way of life under capitalism, this life ending? You know, every day when you read the newspaper on your phone, it's, it's, it's more things that are ending. It's more life that is ending. So I wanted to think about, about that. I wanted to really sink into to this idea of land as a relationship and as as um, as the teacher. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, so this is a question which is about it's again about you how you navigate sort of the complexities of your political, social, artistic, racialized, et cetera, identities, um, and how you navigate your identities. I think that's what this question, it's a very long question. So how you navigate your identities and how you use your identities to further discussion in relationship to power, right? And in relation to, I think what this question is trying to ask, and so I'll reframe it is, Right, we all have social, political, right, identities, and how do we use those um, to further right discussions? Obviously, you're doing that through your writing and your music, but I think perhaps this question is more directed towards your academic uh, sort of uh, work and how you're doing that in your academic work. I'm guessing at that, but that's the that's the frame we'll take for this. I think for me. It has been about thinking that through through um, the practice of, of Anishinaabe intellectual practices. And so um, when I, I hear elders sharing stories or sharing knowledge, they will spend a lot of time talking about how they are positioned, how they came to know this, uh, who they heard the story from. They will talk about it in a very intimate and, and personal way. Um, and then they are also very adept at taking the personal and linking it to um, more communal or global or international systems. And so I think that that's something that I've also tried to, to do in, in my work. I think, um, there's a diversity of ways that Anishinaabe people think. Um, we don't all think the same way. And the way that I think is not the same way that all some of the Anishinaabe people in my family think. And so I think it's sort of a balance between thinking collectively and also telling um, your own story, which I, I think that we all have, have the, the right and the responsibility to do in this sort of web of, of ethics. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering the navigating part, but for me, it has been very much about grounding myself and relearning and strengthening who I am and then being able to 
um, think through things, I think, with others. And it's here, uh, a lot of it has been very deep listening um, with other communities and with other intellectuals and with other artists and with other knowledge holders. You know, this is the way that um, I was taught to think about this through, through my elder or through the language. How do you think through that? How do you, um, what does your culture say about that? Or what does your knowledge system say about that? What can we uh, learn from each other um, in thinking in formation and being in dialogue with each other, which I think when I say be in dialogue with each other and be in relationship with each other, I'm thinking of um, first and foremost, a very deep practice of listening and affirming and um, sharing rather than sort of that academic debate where we're gonna get into a conversation and I'm gonna prove that I'm right and that you're not because I have a lot of footnotes and evidence, right? So it's, it's like a different, I think it's a different intellectual practice that's um, premised on, on strengthening and building communities, uh, even though we might think differently about things. Thank you. So um, I am, I have another question here, which is, and this is a question from, I'm gonna go back to the book. I, you know, I'm a textual person, I'm geeky that way. So I'm gonna go back to the book for just a minute. And um, uh, again, I think this is, this is from pages 93 and 97, at least on the, uh, uh, you know, the digital version. And one of the things you say, oh, you write, if you don't take care of hurt, it comes out big when the shit hits the fan. And then you write, this grief is saving yourself over and over again. So can you talk to us a little bit more because we've, we've, we've touched on trauma a little bit, right? And we've touched on pain a little bit, but let's talk about pain and grief. And let's talk about what it means to save yourself over and over again by actually going through the grief, right? Going through the, the in some ways, and this is, I think, around this decolonization process, but thinking a little bit about that. So can you talk to us a, a little bit more about that? And my next question is going to be from the audience again, which is about decolonization. I think that one of the things about, for me, about being in Ishinaabe in 2020 is that um, the trauma loads are high we've lived through a lot. Our families have lived through a lot of trauma and a lot of grief. And oftentimes we haven't had the privilege to be able to process that grief, um, process that grief according to our own uh, ceremonies and our own emotional practices of care um, because the next trauma is on top of us before we get to process that other one. So I think the last 400 years for, for many indigenous people have been trauma after trauma after trauma, and that has been encoded in our families. And so one of the things I think about um, this process of decolonizing is also sort of trying to figure out how to strengthen this community care and how to figure out our practices of care, our practices of grief, our practices of, of healing, our practices of building community um, uh, after trauma, of our practices of um, conflict uh, resolution and um, reparative and restorative kinds of justice. So I think that I've trying to, in this book, Mashkawaje has experienced this, this trauma. And the whole book is about these seven characters uh, relating back to Mashkawaje. It's the community that, that saves. Um, and so it takes this very individual experience of grief and it collectivizes it. And I think it, it um, I wanted to spend some time thinking about how 
as communities where we're dealing with um, these very big emotions and these this continual trauma. And the fact that this, this um, violence is asymmetric. And so it's hitting some parts of our communities much, much harder than others. Thank you. So the uh, other question that I uh, sort of for, uh, foreshadowed is, this is a question from a participant. So uh, decolonization is for, uh, is, not, is for indigenous people as well as other peoples, obviously. Um, so for all, for lots of people in society. And the question is, despite much effort on the part of indigenous communities, the dominant narratives, and you mentioned this earlier, about and against indigenous peoples have changed very little. Could you talk to us a little bit about why you think that is the case? And then secondly, how can we change these dominant dehumanizing narratives, not just for the First Nations peoples, but for all, including decolonizing for majority communities? Well, I think that there, it, Canada has been, has been built on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and the usurpation of our political power. And the state has a series of systems in place that are meant to maintain that, that are meant to maintain this, um, this dispossession that's expansive. It's the dispossession of indigenous people from our lands, but also from our intellectual practices, from our emotions, from our bodies, from our children, from our families, from our language, from our cultures. There's also a recursive element to this because um, land as it, it was taken from us be becomes property um, and Canada's uh, economic system is now built on the exploitation of, of those natural resources, a racial capitalism where the state and industries need unfettered access to resources to indigenous that are on indigenous lands and they need to maintain the systems that keep indigenous bodies off of those lands. And when indigenous people insert their bodies onto that land to protect it, uh, as our parent um, to protect our systems that bring forth more light, you get things like Standing Rock, you get things like the Wasowatin, you get things like the Oka crisis, um, you get um, all of the all of the indigenous resistance around around pipelines, and so I think that the way that indigenous people are represented, um, the stereotypes. That's uh, just a, a tiny tip of the iceberg um, justification that is used to maintain these systems um, where these kind of genocidal systems where indigenous people remain dispossessed and don't, do not have that kind of political power. And so I'm sort of interested in, in how, um, given that this is the state of things that indigenous people are pushing back, that indigenous people are building indigenous worlds. And a lot of those times those are around blockades or they are um, uh, behind the barricades um, and, and figuring out how to place at the center uh, this, in, this practice of indigenous world building because I think we're quickly approaching this point. And I think the pandemic and the American election um, and this crisis of, of global climate change is showing us, and it has been showing us for quite some time, that this global system that we have built is not sustainable and it's not healthy. And it's, uh, it's a death machine for, for a lot of the anti-colonial black indigenous and brown peoples of the world. Thank you. So my next question is uh, about ways of knowing, and you sort of alluded this in some of your interviews, but really about different ways of knowing. And so again, if we were to go back to the book, one of the beautiful passages I like is about birds. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just say this, the birds are, they are watching the birds, how they interact and communicate with each other. This is on 177 and how they understand consent, care, self-determination, sovereignty. They are, they are watching for queerness. And then it says his whole, his, um, this is on 179, 
the sole reason us and watch is, and they don't watch with their eyes and their brain, they watch with their heart and their muscles. So let's talk about these different ways of knowing, different ways of seeing, different ways of watching, different ways of, commun of communing with the birds, but also, right, gaining knowledge. And one of the things that you brought up earlier was around the university as the site of knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about <laughs> the university is not the only side of knowledge, but other ways of right thinking about watching, whether it's watching for queerness or watching with hearts and mus our heart and muscles. So talk to us a little bit about those different ways of knowing and the importance of that, not only in your work, but the importance of that in, in relation to thinking about decolonization. One of the things that I do in my work at the Dicenta Center for Research and Learning is I, I help um, take groups of, of Indigenous students, um, mostly Dene students in the northern part of Canada, out onto the land with their elders for six weeks at a time. And we build a community and we live according to, to Dene laws and Dene politics. We govern ourselves. Um, the, the Dene nation is one of the more remote Indigenous nations in Canada, they have a lot of land, they have their language, and we take these, these elders out who build a Dene world and then we live in it with the students. Part of what I'm doing there is um, the intellectual work of the, of the university, but in a much different context, in a context where Dene knowledge is, is being embodied, it's being embodied collectively, and it's um, at the center of our, of our intellectual pursuits and of our lives. And so it's interesting to watch the transformation in the students and also the transformation in the learning community um, because it is a learning community. We're all, uh, we're all teachers and we're all learners. The students, um, one of the biggest barriers to post-secondary education in the North is childcare um, and so, the students bring their children with them and we have an on the land program that the children go to during the day to support to support parents and so we have this multi generation learning community um, learning from each other and uh, learning all kinds of different things through the centering of Dene practices, things like moose hide tanning and Dene textile work, uh, hunting, trapping, making dry fish, making dry meat. Um, and then we also have the reading and writing and the, the intellectual discussion, um, ceremony, uh, a physical life that is quite difficult because we are relying very heavily on each other for our basic needs things like water uh things like keeping warm there's a lot of chopping of the wood there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hard work to to build and maintain this community there can be a lot of conflict so we have to figure out how our ancestors uh while working very hard to to build their dna life um figured out conflict in small communities that were in remote locations where everybody is very, very dependent upon each other for, for basic survival. And so I think that what I have learned in these, these contexts is that um, this kind of education is holistic and it involves mind, it involves emotion, it involves spirit, it involves your physical presence, but most importantly, in a relational context, it involves, it's a communal activity. It's not just about me learning a whole bunch of stuff and getting some really nice letters behind my name <laughs> and getting a fancy job at a university. It's about a group of people learning how to live in a good way together and build a world. And I think that kind of education is really interesting to me and it's so generative to me um, because it changes the way I look at the world, which I think is kind of the point of education in the first part of it. And it isn't that academic work isn't a part of it because it is, because we are um, thinking through together. We are reading the books. We are having the intellectual discussions. Um, it's just in a much different context. It's part of it, it's not all of it. 
Right. As as probably right. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that that answer. Uh, so uh, I have another question from an audience member. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and speaking to us here at NYU. I've listened to your album Flight, and it was so immensely beautiful. We read your book, Dancing on Our Turtle's Back in, 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 in Dean's class uh, in American Studies, and helped us think about how decolonization can be truly enacted if we stay, uh, can't be, excuse me, truly enacted if we stay merely at the level of critique of colonial systems, even if that's necessary. But as you say, involves centering indigenous knowledges and cultures. I would be grateful if you could speak to this question of critique versus uh, embracing indigenous cultures. Do you see a parallel between that choice and what you said today about the importance of being in dialogue and building bridges between different communities of color? Well, critique is part of Anishinaabe intellectual traditions. You know, if you're building a canoe and you do kind of a half-assed job <laughs> and the Sorry. elder doesn't critique you. It doesn't work out. <laughs> you're do, it's, you're not, yeah, you're not, it's so, so <laughs> we All have right. to sort of, and that's one of the things that life in the bush really teaches you. Oh, indigenous excellence is actually really important to us because our lives depend upon it. If we don't do these things well and, um, if we're not practicing to the point where we're, we're in pursuit of excellence, then things fall apart really, really quickly. So I think that, um, I think that indigenous cultures sometimes deal with critique differently um, rather than sort of because, uh, because for Anishinaabe culture, that uh, practice of care is so important. So rather than ripping somebody else apart academically, or engaging in a very heavy critique of their work, the, 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 the Anishinaabe, a more traditional Anishinaabe way might be to write a paper on the same topic, but say exactly what you think. So you're not in direct conflict because if you, again, if you go back to that bush, conflict has to be managed in a, in a small intimate camp differently. If you're calling people out and attacking each other uh, constantly, the whole community falls apart very, very quickly. And so critique is done in a different way. There's a different practice of it, but we still have it and it's still important. And the same thing with excellence. Excellence is still practiced and it's still important. It's important for the whole community. If you have really excellent hunters or really excellent fishers, then there's a benefit to the whole community. And I think that that's, um, I think that that switch is really important. Um, because, yeah, because indigenous culture doesn't just mean that we just accept everything and everything is, is fine. Um, there's a rigor, there's a rigor, I think, to the knowledge systems that my ancestors practiced. And it's a different rigor than you see in the academy, but it's still, it's still just as important. Thank you. So my last question, or uh, yes, oh, the, sorry, getting reminders. You know, they like to remind me those dings. Right. Um, <laughs> so my last question, um, before I let you, if, if you have some final thoughts, is really this uh, concept that you've talked about resurgence, right? And um, so can you talk to us a little bit about this idea of resurgence? what it means to you, how you've thought about it in relation to these ideas around resiliency, et cetera. Um, and um, couple of the, a couple of the participants have had some questions around that as well, right? This idea of resilience, this idea of resurgence and how, um, how that works. I think for me, um... The resurgence is, is very much about indigenous Anishinaabe world building. It's very much about centering um, Anishinaabe worlds and Anishinaabe practices and Anishinaabe knowledge and building a future in the present um, that brings forth more life, that works in formation with other anti-colonial peoples, that works in formation with um, Black land-based politics and, and Black world building um, practices and creates a different kind of, of future. It's less about responding 
to the state and it's less about responding to um, the kind of the racism and the white supremacy of the state. And it's more about responding to the needs, uh, the material needs, the intellectual needs, the artistic needs uh, of, of our communities and building the alternative. I think that that's the, the clearest way for me. It's about building that alternative in, in real time. Um, with with uh, the people and the the life that I'm that I'm in relationship with, and um, that's sometimes a turning inward, uh, but it's also a turning outward and an expansion because um, because of that deep relationality brings about an internationalism and a globalism that I think is really important. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, or this morning or this afternoon. We have people all over the world. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to our partners in the Native Studies Forum, uh, to Liz and Dean. Thank you to my entire team. And thank you to Leah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing what you have. Thank you for all the work that you are doing, have done, your writing, your music. And thank you for inviting us in to actually see, listen, and hear. Um, we hope that everyone out there continues to take very good care. As I started by this opening, these are challenging times, and they're particularly challenging times for many members of the communities that we've been discussing here tonight. So remember, if you're going to take care of someone else, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first. Okay, so because because sometimes we have a tendency to take care of others before we take care of ourselves. So please, please take good care. Let's work in community. I always, uh, I usually end with two quotes. And so I will do the same that I always do. My first quote uh, is, uh, many people know this. It's uh, obviously from uh, Lilia Watson. If you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you come here because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And then of course, my other, one of my other favorite quotes, of course, is for, from, you know, one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin, the world is before you and you need not leave it or take it as it was when you came in. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. <laughs>